just to let everyone know. So, all right. So this morning, we're gonna get started with our business breakfast. And we're lucky to have uh, some wonderful uh, guests with us this morning uh, from the county. And I'm gonna let Frank Ramey introduce them in just a short moment. Uh, before we get right to that, I do wanna give just a couple of reminders and updates about what's going on with the chamber. Um, so if you got a pen and piece of paper, you might wanna jot down a couple of dates and times. Um, right now through the month of March, we are currently uh, seeking nominations for our business person of the year. So you can go to louisachamber.org on our homepage and click on the logo and you'll be able to place a nomination for a business. Last year was uh, an incredibly challenging year. However, it was also a very uh, innovative uh, uh, and uh, we made a lot of adva advancements last year. So I know that there's a lot of businesses worthy of recognition and even so being nominated. So please take some time to consider nominating a business for their hard work and efforts last year. And we're also accepting um, board nominations. We are, we have some seats to fill going into the next chapter of the chamber leadership. So we are looking for board nominations. Um, you can go to the chamber website under um, about us and it says our leadership and there's a nomination link there. It gives all the information about what it means to serve on the board of directors expectations. And of course you can reach out to myself or Bo Bundrick who is um, also part of the nominations committee for the chamber. Um, on March 18th, we will be doing our Business Women's Roundtable. Um, that will be in-person and virtual, uh, the combination, and that will be at 53rd Winery. Uh, that is 1130 to 1, so it's during a lunchtime, and you can get registered up for that on our calendar. We're also going to be launching this month a new series in partnership with the Central Virginian Small Business Development Center, um, where we'll be doing monthly um, dedicated time for one-on-one -on -one coaching, coaching and guidance for businesses. So please help us get the word out uh, to that. A lot of businesses aren't fully aware of some of the services, the free services that they can get through the Central uh, Virginia SBDC. So we're excited to do that. And then last but not least, this week, this Saturday, actually, we're doing a soft launch for our Unplug and Play in Louisa campaign for this summer's uh, campaign to attract people to Louisa County and get them moving around the county, uh, supporting our businesses, finding how great it is to live and, and visit Louisa. So be on the lookout for that information, help us share and spread the word. Um, that is going to be a significant campaign to helping our businesses bounce back and generate revenue, as well as bring people to the area, whether it's for day trips, or uh, extended weekends or for week long vacations. So those are just the brief updates uh, related to the chamber and what's going on. So we're gonna go quickly through some introductions. We have quite a few people on here. So I'm just gonna call, when I call your name, if you will please unmute yourself, um, tell us who you are and who you're with. And because we have um, a significant topic to discuss today with the county updates, I wanna try to keep those introductions brief um, and at the end, if we do have additional time, then we can open the floor back up for you to make any special announcements about what's going on with your business um, or any uh, events or things like that that are coming up. So I'm going to start right from the top on my screen. We're going to start with Sharon. Please unmute yourself and introduce. Okay, I'm, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm Sharon McDonald with Adult Community Education and we are finding ways to operate through this pandemic. We have just started some Zoom meetings and we are looking at trying to get a gazebo outside over our picnic table so that we can keep on going. That's wonderful, welcome. Okay, <clears throat> cool. Can you unmute yourself, Joel? All right, we're gonna to jump to Michael Paul. Everybody, I'm Michael Paul, I'm with SCORE and we are a nonprofit that provides free men to small businesses looking for people to help, small businesses to help and 
new mentors um, in our organization. Thanks for letting me introduce myself. Good morning, Ed. Hi, good morning, everybody. I'm Ed Evans. I'm with Advanced Network Systems. We're a full service IT firm uh, based out of Charlottesville, but we uh, support businesses throughout the state of Virginia and uh, up into the DC area. Uh, we provide a wide range of IT services um, as, as well as managed service solutions. Some of the areas we're helping businesses with right now are network security, especially with remote workers. Additionally, we're helping them become compliant with their networks as more and more businesses are being required to be compliant to um, get loans, uh, get cybersecurity, as well as their customers are requiring it. So whatever your IT needs are, feel, feel, please feel free to reach out to me. We'd love to help you. Thank you so much. Good morning. Thank you, Jack. You said Jack? Yes, sir. Yeah. Jack Manzari, good to see many old friends and a special shout out to uh, Rappahannock and Central Virginia Electric Co-op and the administration and the Board of Supervisors and everybody that supported that uh, connectivity effort. It's, uh, it's going to be a big, uh, uh, it's, a, it's an important program that's going to shift economic uh, development and education to Louisa and much more. Good morning. Good to see you, Jack. Um, Allison. Hi, I'm Allison Thomas. I own Serenity Scenes, digital photography and digital art. And uh, I've recently added a new uh, person or new shop, Sweet Art Emporium in Fluvanna. It is now carrying some of my smaller work. Uh, Annie Gould Gallery is carrying some of my larger work. And I'm always available on the internet, serenityscenes.com. I do unique nature images for home and office. Good morning, Mike. Hello, um, Mike Varner, Carter Printing Company. Good morning, thanks for joining us. Mike is with Carter, a new, a new member with us. So glad you're here this morning. Thank you. Um, Ann. Good morning, I'm Ann Lewis with Rappahannock Electric Cooperative. I'm the Director of Member Services and Community Relations for our Eastern Region. And I see some of my colleagues are also on this call and we're all excited about the partnership with Louisa and Firefly and Dominion. We are too, good morning, Ann, good to see you. John. John Napsiger with Child Health Partnership. Uh, we work with pregnant moms and families with young kids around uh, child and family health and positive parenting. Good to be with you this morning. Good morning, good to see you. Lisa. Hi, I'm Lisa with Louisa Reentry Council. I work with folks coming out of incarceration, coming back to Louisa, making sure they stay on the positive ad, um, road and we even uh, are very good about helping them with employment. So thank you to the employers in Louisa. Thank you, Karen. Good morning, Karen Welch, Executive Director of the Louisa Art Center. Um, we're still here, get growing and, and, uh, and getting stronger despite the pandemic. Just lots of little activities going on, lots of arts and craft classes. I'm so looking forward to this um, warmer weather so we can get outside and continue to brighten people's lives. Wonderful. Uh, Mayor Knuckles. Garland Knuckles, I'm a mayor for the town, Louisa, and just glad to be here this morning. Good morning, good to see you. Supervisor uh, Dwayne. Good morning, I'm Dwayne Adams. I'm uh, the Mineral District Supervisor on the Louisa County Board of Supervisors. Good to see everyone this morning. Welcome, thanks for joining us. Uh, Tom, click. Hey, I'm Tom Click with Patriot Industries over in Fern Club. Good morning, good to see you, Bo. Bo Bundrick, Louisa County Public Schools and Secretary of the Chamber. Glad to see everyone this morning. Good morning, uh, Tammy.
Yes, I'm Tammy Boxley with Out of the Box Catering. Uh, we can handle all of your catering needs. And I'm also on the board of directors for the Louisa County Chamber of Commerce. And I'm also the board liaison for the business breakfast. Yes, good morning. Sheridan. Oh, morning. <laughs> um, I'm Sheridan Grimm and I am with uh, Southern Revere Vineyard and Farm. Uh, we actually just broke ground last week. Very exciting on our building finally for our uh, farm winery and brewery. I'm hoping to have that open by the end of the year, hopefully fall in time for nice weather. <laughs> Wonderful. Felicia. Good morning. My name is Felicia Ainsa. I am the Director of Economic Development for Rappahannock Electric. Nice to be here. Good morning. Thanks. James. James Dickerson, can you unmute? All right. Um, how about Kim Highland? Good morning, Kim Highland. I'm the director of the Fluvanna Louisa Housing Foundation. Good morning, Mike Cavros. Uh, good morning, everybody. This is Mike Cavros with Calliope's Orchard. Happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, excuse me, Sarah Marshall. Hi, everyone. Sarah Marshall with Dominion Energy. I'm glad to be here and still very excited and proud to be a part of the partnership bringing broadband to the county along with um, Firefly, CVEC, Rappahannock Electric, and Louisa County. So thanks everyone and glad to be here. Good morning, Troy. Good morning, uh, Troy Dillard, Dillard Alarm Company, uh, serving both residential and commercial customers around the lake. Good to be with you guys. Good morning. And we also have Mark Ponton. Uh, I think I said that wrong. He's with REC. He couldn't get his um, speaker to work this morning, but good morning, Mark. I think that I have gotten everyone on the list. Uh, Joel Kendall was also joining us via the phone. I'm not sure if he can unmute himself or not. So uh, Marie, is Marie with you, Frank? Does she want to interrupt? <laughs> Scooting up here. Good morning, everyone. Oops, am I off? Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Marie Snyder. I own Lake Anna Linens, and I'm also the chairman of the board for the Louisa County um, Chamber of Commerce. I did want to all say thank you. Welcome, everyone, this morning uh, for joining us, and thank you, uh, Christian and uh, the other Louisa County government officials for presenting the state of the county update. I look forward to this every year, and um, I'm excited to hear what's going on. Great. Thanks, Marie. And I, it looks like I missed someone. Mark? C. Hey, good morning. Yes, my name is Mark C. I'm the manager of information technology and cybersecurity for Rappahannock Electric Co-op. It's a privilege to be part of the group again this morning. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. I also want to, before I turn it over to Frank for introductions, I do uh, would like to acknowledge and thank our sponsor for this morning, um, Old Dominion Electric Cooperative. Um, I got a message. I'm going to try to let get them into their system. They're having a little bit of trouble. So I'll work on that when I turn this over to Frank for um, introductions of our special guests. So Frank, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Thanks, Tracy. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see everyone. Uh, if nothing else, if nothing less, by Zoom. Uh, it's great to see Jack. Uh, nice to see you, buddy. Um, this morning, it, it really is a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Christian and and uh, his cohorts in crime, so to speak. Uh, I'm just playing, um, but we're we're really happy to have them back with us this morning uh, to give us an update on uh, the inner workings of our uh, of our local government and. Uh, I thought in the interest of time, since we've had, we have such a, a, a great group of people with us this morning, rather than spend a great deal of time with a lot of uh, bios, uh, I thought I'd just tell you just a little bit about Christian. Most of you that have been here for any length of time do know Christian. And um, he, he basically um, is the 10th 
uh, county administrator that we've had here uh, in Louisa County. Um, and uh, he was appointed obviously by the Board of Supervisors and he holds a bachelor's degree uh, in, in the environment, uh, environmental, uh, well, cut off on me. Anyhow, sorry about that. Uh, but basically, um, I, I would like him actually to, as he goes through his presentation, um, speak a little bit about the people that he has that support him, uh, Andy Wade, uh, as the um, economic uh, development director, as well as uh, Jeff Farrell, the assistant uh, county administrator. And just let, let uh, Christian take it off and, and, and share this information and, and we're, we're just gonna go from here. Uh, so Christian, with that being said, I'd really appreciate if you'd uh, kick off our meeting and uh, fill us in. Great, well, thanks so much. Um, and Frank and Tracy, am I able to share my screen if I wanna throw a short slide back up? Let's see if this works. I just gave you permission as host, Christian. So you should be able to, you're just gonna need to toss that host back to me when you're done. Great, can do. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see that okay. And I'm I'm joined this morning by uh, Jeff Farrell, our Assistant County Administrator, and Andy Wade. Uh, just in the interest of time, we won't spend too much time going over bios. I think many of you know Jeff and Andy. Jeff um, joined us in general services back in 2014 and 13. Uh, Andy's been with us since 2009 as Economic Development Director. And they're just two of the great folks that we have on our team here. And if you ever need anything from the county, please reach out to me. We'll put you in, in touch with the right person uh, with the county to help you out. But just looking at what we'll talk about today, we'll take a quick look back at um, 2021. Uh, just a really quick look at the 2022 budget, some discussions about emergency services and growth and comprehensive planning and economic development. And, you know, in years past, I think we always get a little bit long winded. Um, versus the time that you all have allotted for us. And I don't think it leaves enough time for questions at the end. So we're really gonna kind of try to fly through this because I know that, um, I know you all probably have questions about broadband and I'm I'm really excited that uh, that we have folks from REC and, and Dominion, our partners uh, in that effort uh, with us today. It was, yesterday was great. And we'll talk about that more in a moment. So just looking back, at it, it, we were putting this slide together and I, I couldn't help but look back at the, um, at the the agenda that I threw out for you uh, last year this time when we did the update and obviously the pandemic materially impacted us that's that's the old agenda down there on the lower right and um but I, I was really happy when I looked back at that I was like you know we set those goals last year and despite the fact that we we had a pandemic that upended the county and the state and the nation we still got a lot of those goals accomplished it took a little bit longer than we thought we were going to but We'll talk about some more of these as we go along, but we deal, did still move forward uh, with plans to, to build the Lake Fire Station. The board last night convened a group to look in, at that in more detail. We'll talk about that, obviously broadband. We worked through the comp plan update and we'll talk about the ordinance update that we did as well and did a lot of economic development. But I was just really pleased in looking back at that, that we still, despite the pandemic, got a lot done last year. So just a quick retrospective, I, you know, we closed the county offices briefly um, early Excuse last me, year. Christian. Yes. Excuse me. Uh, my view doesn't show any of the slides advancing. Oh, how about that? So just checking on that. Let's, uh, let me turn this over to my technical guru and see if we can. There we go. You got it. Um, it. It did change to one slide. I'm not sure that it, if you want to scroll to one and see if it happens. Go up to slideshow on the toolbar. that and then click um yeah there you go from beginning and then now you should be able to just click through it
Are you seeing all of them? Yeah, it's not scrolling through the, uh, there we go. Here, here. Yeah. Are we still good? Yeah. Okay, so you, Tracy, you can see the agenda slide right now? Yes, thank you. All right, good. So, and this is the retrospective slide. Just stop me again if you can't see anything. We'll figure out a way to do it somehow or another. It'll all be fine. But, uh, you know, just talking about um, a look back at last year, we did have to close the county offices briefly during the pandemic. But if you've been in the county office building, you see that it looks like a, a materially different place right now. There's lots of barriers up uh, to keep folks safe uh, in this much different environment that we have to operate in right now. Um, but we've certainly developed a lot of new ways to offer services, a lot of things being done remotely. And I, I think maybe what's important about that is much like many of your businesses, I expect that many of the lessons that we've learned will carry forward beyond the pandemic. Um, and we'll certainly be glad to get off of Zoom and get back in in-person meetings when it's right to do so. Um, but from an efficiency standpoint, this is um, certainly taught, about, taught all of us some valuable lessons that we'll all use moving forward. We got a lot of CARES funding. Um, Andy will talk about how we applied some of that CARES funding from an economic standpoint in the county. Um, we also applied some of that to broadband infrastructure. Um, and we did a lot of uh, facility and infrastructure improvements uh, here on the county side as well. Some new fire and rescue equipment, a new generator and our emergency shelter, um, some improvements in our, in our uh, in building infrastructure that allowed for better spacing. So use that CARES funding as we move through last year. And then as we got to the end of last year, they extended the deadline uh, through December 31st of this year. So we're well on the way with the majority of those projects. Um, I want to talk briefly about vaccinations. I don't want to spend too much time on it. Um, we're working very closely with the health department. As many of you probably know, we have operated, I think, six vaccination uh, sites in the county now to date. Uh, we have a significant number of our fire and rescue staff that are trained up and now helping the health department give injections. And we're operating that site at the metal gym. Now, if you're curious about how to get your how to get your vaccination you have to be registered through the health department you can now they've centralized a uh, they centralized a system uh, now with a call-in center at the state level with a thousand people staffing that call-in center and you can also go to vaccinate.virginia.gov um, and right now we are in phase 1b so that's anybody over 65 or between the ages of 16 and 64 uh, that have pre-existing conditions under the CDC. So if you have more questions about that, I'm happy to answer. I'm happy to answer them today or happy to get you in touch with the right person at BDH. But I think the Blue Ridge Health District has been great for us to work with. And I, um, we've had to spool up a significant amount of resources to supplement what they're able to do in Louisa County. Um, as the supply ramps up, I just don't think they have enough staff to do all these rural localities and they really require the county to step up. So glad to talk about that more as we move forward if you have any questions. I wanna talk a little bit about the budget. I did this in a, in a big number of slides in the past and I'm not gonna do a big number of slides today. We'll just do a couple and, and just hit it kind of from an overview standpoint. We're looking at potentially uh, maybe about a 4% growth rate uh, in real property tax assessments. Um, sales tax, looking at some potential increases there, about 25% or so. So about overall a 2.5% growth in total revenues. So that'll be about $3 million. On the expenses side, we've had some good luck in health insurance in years past that did not hold over to this year. We're going to have a fairly significant increase in our health insurance this year. And that's just you know, part of the cyclical nature of paying for health insurance. We participate in a, uh, a pool called the Local Choice with a number of other Virginia local governments. Um, and for us this year, we had some exposure on our claims that just drove that up a little bit. We've got right now a wedge driven into the budget for a 2% compensation increase for staff. Um, if you're paying attention to the General Assembly, uh, there was some late moving uh, efforts at, at the end of last week in the budget and both sides passed a 5% increase for state employees and state supported local employees. And there's a question right now as to whether or not that applies over the two year biennium. We did a 3% increase in the current year. We could do a 2% uh, in the coming year and that would handle things from a biennial standpoint. If they compel uh, that whole 5% to occur in one year, then that's, that's kind of a different equation, but more to come on that um, <clears throat> as we move forward and see what the governor actually approves when he signs the 
budget. Uh, the budget does have seven additional people in fire and emergency services, one in general services, and one in the um, in the county attorney's office. Overall, operational expenses were up about will be up about four percent if they're approved by the board. There's a five point three million dollar decrease in the capital projects budget that varies pretty significantly on a year to year basis. Uh, the board did just approve last night. If you're if you were following along with the board meeting the issuance of $9 million in debt for the construction of the addition to Jewett Elementary School. So we are moving forward with that. <clears throat> and outside agency requests went down about $450,000. The board's had two lengthy work sessions on outside agencies. Um, and last night they kind of went through their agency by agency final decisions. There are a couple still to be decided, but let me know if you wanted more detail on any of those. So overall budget projections, um, looking at um, the request for 22, it's about a $7 million deficit, but there's about a $2.8 million operating surplus. Um, and then looking at 23's projections, about a $1.4 a $1 million operational surplus and a $6.7 million deficit. So as we look at those, we try to do these long range projections and some of these capital project bud capital projects budgets, um, as we look at going to be at what's going to be required in years going forward. You see those kind of big CIP budgets that are driving some of these overall potential deficits. Thankfully, the county has got some pretty significant fund balances built up. Uh, we have about $8 million in our general fund balance and about another $8.2 million in our CIP fund balance. It's been set aside and that is set aside on an annual basis to pay for projects like this. So broadband yesterday, and we'll leave some time to talk about this in further detail. I'm sure folks are gonna have questions and we've got plenty of our partners well represented on the phone today or on the, on the Zoom call today. But yesterday we entered a historic partnership with Firefly, uh, REC and Dominion to bring gigabit speed internet to every end user in Louisa County. And this is a lengthy project. Um, what we entered into last night with them uh, was a memorandum of understanding that lays out essentially two phases of a three phase project. The first phase involves, uh, the first two phases really involve a significant amount of feasibility studies and engineering. Um, that's gonna be followed up by an SEC application by Dominion. Um, Dominion and REC play a vital role in this because they're involved in the infrastructure preparation and deployment. If you're familiar with you know, hanging uh, fiber on or within a power easement, uh, make ready costs are a really significant uh, part of any one of these efforts. And that has to happen because fiber has to be hung at a, at a height that's safely below uh, power infrastructure, but also that's safely above anything that's underneath it on the ground. And so make ready costs can involve putting in taller poles, it can involve preparing the right of ways and easements and other ways. And this is really the uh, I don't want to say a bulk of the work that needs to be done, but certainly it's a very expensive and time consuming effort and it requires a lot of engineering and you know somebody asked yesterday like you know where is where is this going to start um, and you know where and when is certainly the the million dollar question. Um, it, and I, I gave this example yesterday I guess building fiber is is somewhat like building a road. You know, you you want to be able to connect it to good roads on either end, or there's really not much reason to build the road. So you you build fire, you build fiber out from existing fiber connections that are already lit, and that extends the network throughout the county. Now, this engineering and feasibility and make ready work can take place concurrently in multiple areas of the county, but it is a time-consuming process. You know, I, I have folks say, well, you know, why why are you looking at the end of 2025 and <clears throat> you know, my the first thing I want to say is because, you know, that's a lot better than 2026 or 2027, which may be, um, you know, where some of our partners uh, thought was a more realistic timeline. But I want folks to know that we'll be move fo moving forward as quickly as we're able to get the project done with our partners. Um, the county is playing a funding and coordination role, and I certainly can't fail to mention Firefly which will be the end user provider on a countywide basis. So regardless if a power, if someone gets their power from REC or Dominion, Firefly is still going to be the internet service provider um, that provides and supports and bills for the end user service. 
their service packages are um, $49.99 for 100 megabit per month connection, uh, 100 megabit uh, per second connection, and $79.99 uh, for a one gigabit connection. No contracts, no upfront, no upfront costs, no setup fees. Um, that's that's it for. Uh, so I, I think that's a really quality offering that they have. It's competitive um, here in the state or anywhere nationwide from a price standpoint, and and they're having some some, some great success on their existing networks where they're already offering that service. So really exciting. Uh, yesterday was a really exciting day, and now the work begins to make this a reality. So emergency services, I talked a little bit in the budget um, about additional positions that are in the budget. We applied for what's called a safer grant to fund those additional positions this year. We did not receive it. We will likely apply for a safer grant again next year for additional positions. The positions that are in the budget this year, seven positions are primarily focused on the western end of the county and the Trevilians, um, kind of that sector. We have a we have a high call volume out on that side of the county, and that's kind of pulling our countywide resources from other areas to support it, which is increasing response times elsewhere. So that's going to be a really important addition. We've uh, talked earlier about the Newbridge uh, Fire and Rescue Station. That's going to be moving forward as we move throughout this calendar year, and staffing will be required when it's done, either late this year or early next year. So potentially additional grant-funded or county-funded positions as we move forward with that. The other thing that I, I want to talk about, and this may be a good segue into some of Jeff's remarks, we've, we've done a lot of changes to comprehensive planning, and we've talked to you all about that in the past few years. Um, and really where we started to focus our efforts late last year and early this year was on looking at population growth, where that population growth is going to occur in the county, and how we plan for it from a capital infrastructure standpoint. And this really hits home when we're talking about emergency services. Um, response times are governed by the number of people and the apparatus that are available and also their location in the county. So making sure through our capital projects and planning process that our infrastructure is placed in the right areas to make our, our service delivery uh, provisioning as efficient as if, and effective for the citizens as, as, as it can be. So maybe I'll turn it over to Jeff to talk about that in a little more detail. <clears throat> yep. Thank you, Christian, and good morning, everybody. Um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about planning and um, growth that we're seeing, um, and, I'll, and I'll probably touch back on that emergency services um, planning effort. So um, as you all know, we uh, the 2020 census is complete. Um, we don't expect that we're gonna get that data until probably early fall, which is later than normal um, affected by the pandemic, um, which is uh, gonna have some effects on a lot of, um, uh, a lot of government services uh, in terms of funding and budgeting. Um, current uh, estimates that, uh, th that we've developed is gonna put the population of Louisiana County somewhere around 39,000 people. Um, the way we did that, um, was we took the 2020 census data in earlier years and, and tracked that with um, building trends um, and the number of building permits issued year by year um, and assuming the, the the ratio of the number of people in each one of those dwellings stays relatively the same it puts us somewhere around 39,000 people given the the, the number of um, new dwellings we've had in the last decade um, so this is a pretty big increase it's about 17.6 percent uh, it's next year almost 6,000 people. Again, that's an estimate. So, you know, we could be down in 4,000 people or we could be up, you know, 8,000 people. Um, and as I mentioned, we developed those numbers based on permitting. And I wanted to talk about, um, you know, the, the last 10 years we've seen some growth, but specifically in the last three years or two years, we've seen a significant, significant amount of growth and activity in building and zoning. Um, just since when you compare, you know, last year's 2020 to 2018, um, you're, you got 104% increase in single family homes. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of people jump immediately to, well, those are all lake houses and vacation houses. Um, they're not. Um, when, when we map these out, they're spread really evenly across the county um, in our growth areas and our rural areas. They're spread across everywhere. Um, so people are moving to this community um, for, uh, to live here permanently. 204% um, uh, increase in commercial building permits. These are new buildings, um, not renovations so that we catch, their, catch those under a different category. And uh, it's an indicator of, um, of a desirability for businesses to locate here and, and the good job that Mr. Wade's doing. 
uh, total permitting up almost uh, 180 percent. Um, and then land use submittals, which is sort of like an indicator that we look at as to what's going to be coming in the next couple of years. Um, land use applications or anything from a rezoning for a big residential neighborhood or big commercial area um, to conditions or special exceptions to allow something to occur. Um, up 33 percent from uh, 2018, which um, in, uh, in, in, in commercial is a lot and, and land use is a lot. That's a big uh, swing up. So it looks like those trends are going to continue. Um, we expect a lot of building permits in the next five years, particularly for residential, um, but we're hoping there's going to be a lot of commercial as well um, with some of the neighborhoods that we know are already coming and have been, gone through land use. Um, we expect a lot there. So uh, all these people are moving to the county. Um, there's a lot going on. Um, not, you know, that's why the effort that we've been doing in the last couple of years has been important. Comprehensive planning um, really gives um, the community and more importantly, the board, um, the, the vision to see what's going to happen in the next 5, 10, 15 years. Where are those people coming from? You know, people drive the amount of services and the more expense that the county is going to have to deal with. Um, when you have more people, you have more emergency vehicles, you have more sheriff's office vehicles, you have more people working in this building, in the schools, um, ac across the board. So where are the people going to move? How do we efficiently um, locate and pay for those services when they're needed? Um, so um, we've been doing this comprehensive planning that's folded into uh, redoing um, all of the ordinances to tie the comprehensive plan into law. Um, those were adopted by the board on February 15th. Um, those are going to those new ordinances take a specific have a specific goal to protect the rural area and try and um, I wouldn't say limit development, but make sure that it fits in the rural area a little bit better and then really opens the gate to um, making it easier for commercial development and denser residential development to happen in the growth areas. Uh, it supports a higher quality of development by requiring standards for architecture and some standards for landscaping with the idea that uh, we want um, those investments that the county is making into those growth areas to be um, supported by um, quality businesses. Um, so uh, the next step in those ordinances were to actually define new regulations regarding solar. Uh, those of you that are, have been paying attention have seen a good number of these developments come through planning. Uh, and, and our board um, in the last year. Um, and every time those come in, um, I wouldn't say we're shooting from the hip, but they're all treated a little bit differently because we don't have a standard set of regulations for them. Um, we do now. Much better. Um, <clears throat> we do now. And some of the things that um, are important there are um, not necessarily where they're located, but um, what do we do um, so that maybe the community doesn't see them? How do we buffer them, screen them? What about reclamation? You know, these things go in, and then what happens 30 and 40 years from then, uh, from now? Um, so we, we we put in there. There's some bonding information that requires them to be clean, uh, remove the ground return to um, um, before the panel conditions. There's a whole set of regulations, and we do expect um, a lot of solar development to be applied for in the county. So it's nice to have a set of rules. Um, so our next steps moving forward with planning, um, Mr. Goodwin indicated that, you know, we've been planning a lot for emergency services um, and that's important so that we have good response times. But as population's increasing, we need to know where the, that population is and we need to know what kind of services that population is going to need. Um, so the next step of planning for us is going to be small area plans, uh, facility plans, um, a, a plan for all county facilities. Um, and a transportation plan for each one of those growth areas. And these planning efforts will help um, the board budget for long-term cost. I know uh, Christian talked about the significant capital um, budgets in the next five and 10 years. Um, we need to know what, what those expenses are gonna be. Um, are we gonna need a new school in six, or seven years? If we do, where is that gonna be? How much is it gonna cost? So that the county has a plan to save for that, acquire the land, um, and build the building in a time that's appropriate. Um, so we're not catching up later, um, we're planning now. Um, those small area plans will help us do that. The facilities plans um, will help define what services we need and where those go. And the transportation plans um, are gonna help us uh, get grant money from VDOT and plan efforts and help developers pay for uh, improvements in our growth areas. That I'll hand it over to Andy. All right, good morning guys. Um, I want to talk about CARES Act funding, uh, infrastructure planning, 
uh, Lake Anna Resort, which is an exciting project. And then I want to touch a little bit more on solar um, in addition to what Jeff mentioned. But um, CARES Act, the county rolled out a, a program back in the uh, summer. We uh, called it the Louisa Opportunity Fund. Uh, some of you on this call uh, were beneficiaries of that, so that's good to see. Um, the Department of Treasury charged each locality or entity that uh, rolled out a program such as this, utilizing CARES funding to establish internal protocol um, uh, when developing the program. And that, that was to ensure that um, we could go back and uh, um, cross-check funding uh, sources and, and, and uses uh, against our internal protocol in the event we were audited by the uh, Department of Treasury. But that's to say, we, uh, we initially started with a $750,000 uh, allocation to the program. Uh, we were surprised at the, um, uh, the interest, honestly, that we, that we got in the first round. Um, and ultimately, uh, post first round, we received a, a ton of feedback from the community that you know, maybe people weren't aware of the program, maybe uh, it wasn't open long enough. So subsequently, we uh, launched round two and three. Uh, the end result of the program, we uh, extended 22, uh, 22 grants uh, to 22 different business, well, some, some businesses qualified in uh, multiple rounds, but 22 grants total, um, totaling $214,000 uh, that was invested back into the community. And we really focused on businesses that were impacted by COVID, uh, had COVID related expenses due to uh, um, closure, um, those businesses that were in, impacted by uh, the executive order coming from the governor's office, I believe it was 53 and 55. Um, but overall, it was, it was a uh, it was a good program. Uh, we would have liked to use uh, all of the money, um, but nevertheless, we uh, we were able to extend and uh, uh, put back into the community $214,000. So we're, we're happy with the uh, the results of the program and. Um, Hope that you guys are so. Um, inf infrastructure planning, couple a uh, couple projects that the board has recently taken action on. Um, most recent last night, the board approved to uh, design, permit, and uh, acquire easements to extend uh, to eventually future in the future extend utilities from uh, Ferncliff to Shannon Hill uh, growth area. As you know, we the county is invested and in, uh, is. Um, interested in developing the Shannon Hill Regional Business Park and what this uh, infrastructure uh, planning uh, will, will help us do is take that site to a tier four on the uh, Virginia Business Ready site scale. Uh, tier four means that we can deliver utilities to an end user within a 12 month period. It increases the marketability of that uh, not only the Shannon Hill uh, Business Park but the Shannon Hill growth area. There's roughly 3,500 acres in that growth area based on the comprehensive plan uh, amendments and there's a lot of potential uh, growth in that area. That is a growth area um, in addition to uh, several others we have in the county. We made a concerted effort to make sure that we focus growth in those growth areas for that very reason. And we are uh, um, going to pull the trigger on that uh, that contract here soon and again the uh, the the reason for doing that is to increase the marketability and uh, that's primarily driven by the interest that we've received in that park um, to date since we've uh, since we've bought it and it uh, complements existing uh, or ongoing due diligence that we've done on that site to date. Um, the other infrastructure project is, is related to the uh, Lake Anna Resort um, development, and that is an exciting development. We, uh, the, the board approved uh, entering to an MOU with the developers of uh, the Lake Anna Resort back in February. It's LA Resort LLC is the, is the name of the developer. Um, essentially, that MOU is a three-phase uh, progression plan forward, and phase one is the design phase for um, the resort and also the design phase for the county, assuming ownership and operations of the uh, wastewater treatment plant at the Lake Anna Plaza. Um, phase two is uh, financial commitments of, of, of both uh, entities to the uh, MOU. And that's important because 
in my time here, never before have we had a uh, developer make a capital contribution of a million dollars to a um, what is going to be a county owned infrastructure project. And that's what LA Resort uh, is contributing to this effort. And phase three will be the physical construction of uh, both the upgraded or the brand new wastewater treatment plant and the resort itself. Uh, the new plant construction, the wastewater treatment plant construction will be state of the art uh, technology. Um, it will increase the uh, discharge limits of that, um, that plant from 20,000 to 99,000 gallons per day. That's currently permitted uh, in the uh, DEQ permit. Uh, Lake Anna Resort will be the largest customer of that um, uh, new facility in addition to the existing customers at the plaza. And then also what that does is it gives us control of the uh, wastewater treatment and the discharge point for future commercial development in that 208 corridor, which down the road we believe will become a uh, hotspot for uh, commercial development. Um, just to give you a little idea of, of the, the resort and the amenities uh, quickly is, it's a condo hotel structure, which means that uh, there will be a fee simple ownership of the units. Um, so a portion of those units will be sold to uh, individuals when those individual owners are not uh, using those units, they will place them in a rental pool, just like any other uh, hotel would be. It's a 150 room uh, uh, hotel. Just to give you an idea of the location, it's the last piece of property on the right hand side if you're headed towards the 208 bridge um, with a uh, ton of water frontage on, on Lake Anna. Uh, the capital investment is about $50 million. Uh, that's that's a huge number and it's it, it's going to be a, a really nice development once complete. Estimated job creation is about 30 jobs. They're going to be one, two and three bedroom units. Um, it's about 260,000 square foot uh, facility. And then they're programming and designing uh, the amenities to uh, accommodate four star rating uh, through the hospitality industry. So that those are all um, exciting features of, of the development. They'll have restaurants, meeting and banquet space, which would be important to this organization and anybody else that wants to uh, hold, hold meetings, um, fitness facilities, pools, uh, playground areas, garden areas and of course, water recreation uh, areas. Um, you know, what made this really important for the county was the uh, the fiscal impact that the uh, resort will have. Uh, the county has issued debt for the development of the uh, new wastewater treatment plant. The Lake Anna Resort, once built, uh, satisfies the debt service on that uh, uh, potential $4 million uh, issuance of bonds or, or conventional loan funding in and of itself. So that was a, between the financial impact and the uh, being able to control the growth in the in the 208 corridor and the discharge permit, those were the catalysts that uh, sprung this project forward. And then lastly, I just want to touch on uh, solar. Jeff mentioned it a little bit, but um, the Industrial Development Authority of the county um, owns 800 acres between uh, Chopping Road and Chalk Level Road. It's been a zone industrial for, for many, many years prior to even when I got here. And the sentiment all along has been that, you know, do we really want truck traffic in the center of the county on a major, uh, a, a busy road, um, especially when schools are in session and it's <laughs> extremely busy. And, you know, that differing opinions, but nonetheless, this is uh, probably the highest and best use of that property. And what this, uh, what this does is it takes that property um, out of the non-tax rolls, puts it back on the tax rolls. The, the IDA has uh, entered into a lease with a uh, solar developer. It's uh, proposed for 118 megawatts. Um, and it's a significant rental uh, lease income back to the IDA that they can then deploy elsewhere in the county to uh, continue to promote uh, economic development and uh, projects that create new capital investment and job opportunities with, within the uh, within the community. And again, it takes the uh, potential for increased truck and pedestrian traffic off of that corridor, and it will be well buffered and, and in line with uh, the uh, new solar ordinance that, uh, that Jeff mentioned earlier. Um, that, that really concludes my remarks, and we'd be happy to 
answer any questions that anyone has on anything we discussed this morning. Jack Manzieri, uh, are we up to questions? Yes, go ahead, Jack. A okay. uh, Christian and maybe Dwayne could uh, answer the question about the leadership of this uh, partnership, a diffusion of leadership and completing action plans are a major uh, problem in uh, implementing this uh, program. Uh, too many chiefs, not enough, enough Indians. Could you talk about the governance uh, structure? And uh, secondly, uh, I've sent you the suit uh, referencing eminent domain and uh, the state legislation. Could you talk a little bit about uh, the status of those suits? Sure, so I, I might defer this status uh, to one of our REC representatives because the county's not involved in that and I'm less familiar with it. And easements are gonna be handled on a different basis <clears throat> by the entities that actually need to acquire them. But in terms of talking about how the project's gonna be managed and coordinated going forward, um, I do think the county is gonna be in a coordination role. Um, as we move through the next you know, eight, nine months this year and the feasibility study uh, and the funding structure becomes more clear. I think what the county is going to be interested in doing is, is looking at milestones and incentives for those milestones so that we can help move the project along as quickly as possible. And, you know, I, I'm, you know, we had leadership on the, on the stage yesterday, but there were also a lot of technical people that are playing uh, integral roles in this team who were uh, there at the press conference as well. And that team is, is they're going to be the folks that are working together uh, to, to move this project forward to success. And, and I think what we need the, the citizens and the businesses to know is, as we move forward is that this will get done. So Ann or, or anybody else from REC or Dominion or, or, or anyone else in the line, I'd, I'd welcome any input you have regarding uh, the suit that Dr. Manzaro mentioned. <clears throat> sure, uh, Christian. Hi, good morning. This, this is Mark C. Uh, again, um, the manager of uh, information technology at Rappahack. Yes, the, the, the lawsuit is active. Um, it is ongoing. Uh, but because of that lawsuit and working uh, with this partnership, just like with Dominion and Central Virginia, uh, we will be securing easements all along the way uh, in, because of the result uh, of that, in, that pending lawsuit. So the way to get around that is to make sure we secure easements going forward uh, for this project um, to, to eliminate any, any, any concern of, of having anything like that impact us going forward. We are completely dedicated to this project, uh, Mr. Mark Ponton, who's on the call as well. Mark's having some difficulties with uh, the technology this morning, unfortunately, but uh, Mark was hired uh, as the director of fiber and broadband or broadband and fiber services for Rappahannock uh, to uh, dedicate full-time efforts to this type, this type of project uh, and the advancement of fiber and broadband throughout our service territory. Jack, this is Sarah Marshall with Dominion and um, second, what Marks he said, Dominion's protocol for um, our current broadband efforts underway through our pilot program has been to um, get supplementary easement agreements with all landowners whose land will be impacted, and we'll do the same thing here in Louisa County. We'll go through and get supplementary easement agreements with those who will be traversing their properties. Okay, thank you. Um, does anyone else have uh, any questions if you want to unmute yourself? I have a question. Um, I read in the, uh, the paper just uh, probably a couple weeks ago about a uh, mixed, mixed um, community that uh, Fitzbarnes had put forward, um, was talking about for Habitat for Humanity and using some uh, funds from permits to cover what's not covered by grants. Could could someone please speak to that and just um, where that is in the approval process? Uh, I was just need a little bit more information on that. Yeah, I can um, I can answer that. There's a Habitat for Humanity. Uh, the Charlottesville branch has approached the county about putting in um, a plan unit development community in Ferncliff. 
um, which would be a mix of market rate and um, affordable houses. Um, all of them would be um, uh, the same style. You wouldn't be able to tell the difference uh, from the outside. And they're all single family homes in a pretty open community, um, meaning a lot of open space. Um, so it's not what you would maybe think of with apartment buildings and, and townhouses and, and dense development. Now, funding of that, um, um, they're working through some of the challenges there because there's some infrastructure, some road connections cost, and then the, the site development itself, which gets expensive. Um, so they're applying for some, um, some grant funding from the state for the infrastructure. And um, I'm sure there's gonna be an ask of the county for, for an assistance on some other parts. I think what you read um, and Mr. Barnes had indicated um, in terms of funding, using permitting funding to, to help support it. Um, he spoke about that last night, asking the county to look at um, the feasibility of using impact fees on residential development to offset some of our, our costs. You can't apply impact fees to housing or a housing project like that. But I think the idea would be to use impact fees and this sort of goes back to the, that growth factor where the more people move into the community, the more services you have to offer and those have capital costs. Um, their taxes, their annual taxes are, should pay for the services, but you've got to build them first. So those impact fees um, that, that um, he talked about could take care of some of those areas of the budget, potentially freeing up um, some money to, to help with um, housing or, or a project like this. Okay, thank you. We had a couple of questions in the chat box uh, related to the CARES Act money. Um, and I, th th one question was if there was uh, more money, why weren't um, sole proprietors eligible? Um, and why didn't it open back up to nonprofit organizations? Andy, can you speak to that at all? Yeah, I mean, it, it was just, it really was a function of the uh, the protocol that we set forth in the in developing the program, um, and uh, that was essentially vetted by the finance committee and ultimately the the uh, the board of supervisors as a whole. And um, those two uh, uh, sectors didn't didn't make it into the into the protocol. So I mean, essentially, that that's that's really the answer um, uh, as to why they were not not included. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? Questions in the chat box, but go ahead and unmute yourself. Tracy? Yes, Lisa. Hi. I just want to say uh, kudos to um, Andy and uh, Christian and Jeff. The projects that they're talking about for employment, as you guys know, at least 70% of my participants are working and the solar projects have um, over the last couple of years have given my people a, a, a trade. Um, they have trained them, developed them. They are making out wonderful salaries. They've got benefits. So I just want to say thank you to the county and Andy in particular to bringing these um, projects to Louisa. Thank you, Lisa. Does anybody else have any other questions? We're right at that nine o'clock hour. So I don't want to keep anyone over uh, too long. So I would like to just wrap this up. Um, first of all, just thank you, Andy. Jeff and Christian uh, and the Board of Supervisors, you guys are doing a great job. It's it's a sometimes thank, thankless job, I imagine. Um, you're under a lot of pressures and I think you're doing a great job to move Louisa forward. Um, I know uh, I personally, as, as well as for the Chamber, we're very excited about the steps of, uh, that you're making with the partnership moving forward with fiber and, and broadband, it's it's very exciting. I will, uh, just for the benefit of everyone on the call, I will get with that group and see if we can't have a dedicated conversation related to broadband. Um, and then if there was anything else that was brought up uh, and presented by the county that you have additional questions on or you might like to delve into a little bit more, uh, we can see about perhaps having a separate conversation related to those topics. 
Um, I do want to thank Frank Ramey as our project chair and, and Tammy Boxley for their work. And again, I want to thank Old Dominion Electric Cooperative for sponsoring this breakfast today. I hope you guys did go out and um, support a local business with either coffee or Danish or, or some kind of special treat uh, to honor this breakfast meeting. If you don't get breakfast out, go support a business for lunch. With that, I'm going to bid everyone farewell and have a great Tuesday, and we will see you soon. Thanks again. Thank you all. <clears throat>